Any questions? All right, here we go. Oh, that was an easy toss. We needed yeah. somebody back there to do oh, this. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> question to the Boston property guy. Yeah. So you, uh, you decided to use Think Light in a lot of your uh, uh, buildings, and I wanted to know why you chose them. There's so many companies out there that uh, sell retrofit LEDs. Why Think Light? I'm not with Think Light. I just want to know. You have, a, you have a competing product? Uh, no, no, right. sir. Um, so, so, so I think that uh, we've studied quite a few, and I think it had to do with um, uh, looking at mock-ups, looking at the quality of the product, running through pricing models, cost models with um, Eversource, working out the incentives, and it all sort of came together that way. Dinesh, you, do, you, do you have any more backstory to how you approached Boston Properties? Um, are, are, are we, the team and I worked very closely with Joe Petroni and, 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 and Bill Mackin at the ABLE engineering side. And for them, you know, the way we looked at it was the wattage reduction. That was what got them. Um, um, just to share a quick funny story, I remember when we first met them, we said, hey, we have 131 lumens per watt. And they were like, well, everyone says that, you know, 140, 150 lumens per watt. But when you attach the driver to it, the lens to it, there's, there's relative inefficiencies in the system. And it, go, and it actually ends up producing maybe 90 lumens per watt. So we said, hey, it's 131 net. The chip actually produces 180 lumens per watt. But the effect of that coming out. So they whipped out their calculator and said, if that's true, you should go with an 8 watts. And we were proposing a 10 watts. And they, they, they tried over a dozen types of mock-ups that were there for several months. And what they were leading to was um, a, a competitor's 16 watt replacement. So going from 32 watt to 16 watt, of course it's great, 50%. And we came in and did demos of eight, tens, and 12s. And they said our eight watts was about 5% more light than the 16 watt LED they were leaning towards. And that's what got them. Being able to go from 32 to eight, you know, made the ROI effective. It it made uh, uh, the wattage reduction significant enough to make it a good a good project. Yeah. We, so we did look at other opportunities elsewhere in our portfolio. So four years ago, I, I think we looked at our first LED no, to retrofit, and it just didn't meet our lighting quality specs. And that was at a, another property. So we, there, we went ahead and replaced the entire fixtures with a vapor tight LED. I think it was a Lithonia product. It's a lot more costly than the than the type of retrofit that Think Light offered. Hi, um, <laughs> hi. My name's Lee Doyle. I work with uh, NG with Solar. So, some of your renewable energy investments. What are some of the criteria that you use to evaluate the projects? You know, how do you determine which locations to put them in? What are your what's your is it a payback period or hurdle rate? Who makes the decision in your organization? to go ahead with these projects. Can you elaborate on some of those questions? Good, no, good question. Um, so, so with our solar, um, there's a bunch of steps that we, that we take. And I'm kind of going through those steps, finalizing these steps now uh, for the projects this year. Uh, first step is you know, putting the list together of the stores that currently don't have the solar, uh, vetting the size of the store. Uh, so I'm looking for a larger store so we have more rooftops, so we can get larger generation. Uh, from there, I work with the maintenance and construction team just to find out the age of the roof. The so roof age is a, is a, is a big one there. Uh, once we've vetted that, then I start working with the real estate teams to find out the, the current lease terms of those stores, uh, what the future outlook is for those stores. Uh, and once we go from there, then we start work, then, it's, then we have a, a, a smaller list again. Uh, then it becomes, okay, you know, where are these stores located? What are the SREC markets? Um, and when, then we, you know, then we once we've vetted that, we've come to our selection. We're at a, at a few stores, and we just work with our investment planning team upstairs and uh, work with them to figure out what you know what our payback is. <clears throat> and as long as that works, we get the sign off from the executive team and we move forward from there. So our, our situation is a little bit different because um, we. Uh, do a lot of net metered projects. They're the projects we have successfully done have been net metered, I should say, in the Massachusetts region. And we haven't really scaled beyond Massachusetts and the, and the net metering incentive. And with those incentives, the, the net metering credits, as well as the SREC market and the ITC, the 30% federal tax credit, 
we're, we're able to deliver uh, PPA, power purchase agreement projects that are below the, uh, the tariff rate um, and, and we get savings day one. So that, that has been um, really compelling to our leasing team, to our executive management team, because uh, they, they aren't keen on subsidizing or paying a premium for power. Uh, the, the cost savings are huge. I actually, I wrote my master's thesis on, on how to accelerate uh, PV development in commercial real estate. So, it, 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 and I did it while working at Boston Properties a few years ago, and it was about um, everyone's opinions of risks and benefits and how those vary depending on perspective. And it's certainly true that the leasing team is gonna be aesthetically oriented and you have property management that's thinking operations, like what, is it, what does this mean for me and my property? Do I have to take care of this thing? Do I have to maintain it? And then you have um, legal looking at a completely separate set of issues around defaults and third party risk. And so I tried to isolate each one of those risks and, and, where, and then show the benefits and, and do some, it's called action research, like by embedding myself with those teams and, and convincing them that it was the right thing to do for a number of reasons and trying to mitigate some of the perceived uh, risks and really highlight the benefits. But I'll share my paper with you if you, if you want to read it. All right. So this is for uh, Pat McDonald. I uh, just recently uh, reached out to somebody at Mass Save, and he told me that the, the incentives are shortly or starting to come down some. And my question is, if you know as being a customer and we're continuing to put in money to the uh, to the you know to the uh, energy savings programs why why are why are they going to go come down that's kind of what i want to so know. um i'm not familiar with that uh, we would just reapprove for another three-year plan with our regulators so the the programs are actually fully funded um for at least the next three years um, what does happen from time to time, and maybe this is um, kind of the nature of what you heard, um, as measures become more uh, widespread, individual incentive amounts are reduced a bit because our incentives are meant to simp simply um, transform the market. So if you look at lighting, you know, what used to be um, um, incandescent lighting, once fluorescent became widely adopted, those, those incentives started to go away because we had transformed the market. So um, on, on the LED front, although our incentive levels are at a relatively high level now, they will continue to degrade over the next five years or so, but at a marginal level, yeah. But the message is our, our programs are fully funded for the next three years. If you have a project, please talk to us. Uh, ben, you mentioned in your presentation that there were some benefits in your buildings, not just in cost savings, and uh, but also related to, I think, uh, like a sales and marketing benefit. I assume that means getting a little bit higher rents, uh, potentially, from, from being a more sustainable, more uh, energy efficient building. I was just wondering if you, I didn't see anything there, uh, quantified that benefit uh, within your company, if there's any sense of like the, the actual premiums you get from those things. And I, I don't know, maybe, uh, Craig, if you guys have, have seen anything uh, similar in your customer base as well. So I think we have a lot of uh, tacit knowledge to that effect, but haven't codified the, the, in a scientific manner what the exact premium is. Um, we did uh, get premium rents from Natixis, the global wealth management firm at 888 Boylston Street. They anchored that project. They happen to be a French-owned company. They have a very high-level awareness of their carbon footprint due to that, I think, French ownership structure. And um, they certainly uh, understood what we wanted to do with the building and supported us in some of the more costly measures like uh, active chill beams, which were a tenant improvement premium. So there was some negotiation over the TI allowance and how many dollars they need to install chilled beams versus conventional terminal boxes. And we did give them extra dollars the installed cost actually was much less, and when you look at our development costs, because we didn't have to install all the duct work, it's, it's a wash. So it's really an accounting thing. It, we're paying less out of our development budget um, and uh, giving more money to our tenants to do some of the chilled beam installation. So that was, that was an example. Um, 
some of the benefits that we're selling, though, are really around health and wellness. And if anybody's paying attention to what's happening with Delos and the well building standard, I, I recommend they, they look at that because they've spent seven years doing research about health and wellness and productivity, knowing that we spend 90% of our time indoors. Uh, we'd be ignorant not to realize that the indoor environment we're in has huge impacts to the, our health and wellness. Um, so that, that health and wellness piece, I think, is really the frontier of what we sell. At 200 Clarendon Street, there's no question that there was a perception that building was uncomfortable. So thermal comfort is the big driver there. I think that's what pushed some of the uh, $11 million worth of investment in mechanical systems. We have a single pane glass building with a large southern exposure. When it gets croaked on the southern side in the middle of the winter, we're cooling the south while we're heating the north. That type of thing was causing uh, some occupants to become uncomfortable. So thermal comfort's another one. Um, but whether or not we've quantified that precisely, I think is a good question. I think we know it's there. I think we know they're willing to pay the premium. Um, but I don't have a figure at this point. Maybe, Patrick, if you could start with this question and then from the customer perspective. Um, I'd like your perspective being the utility on deregulation. We're about 20 years in, 15, 20 years in. Um, do you think deregulation was helpful, harmful? What's your view? Yeah, um, great question. And I've been in our industry for 20 years. I, I think if you just look at um, deregulation from different perspectives. From an environmental um, perspective, it, it's been a winner. If you look at, you know, one of my slides showed that uh, some of those lousy fuels uh, are going away in New England. I, that wouldn't have happened without deregulation. And, um, you know, financially, I, I'd love to say that um, we're spending a lot less, but um, that's just simply not the case. I mean, uh, when I, when I, at the outside of gener at the outside of deregulation, I think um, all in was about 10 cents per kilowatt hour, and it's it's north of that now. But I think there's a lot of global um, economic um, issues that, that play into that. So financially, I think the court's still out on on deregulation. So, I was just thinking a little bit about uh, size opening remarks about the revolution, and get your guys' perspectives. Reflect a bit about the revolution you talked about earlier, and how to fix your business going forward on the utility side, how it affect the utility going forward. Some of your slides about fuel mix lead that question a bit. Could you just, can you paint forward about 10 years? Thanks. Well, I, I think one of the areas on the energy side that, that is, is changing is this transparency around building energy consumption. And recently in Boston, we had the Building Energy Reporting and Disclosure Ordinance. So we are uh, putting out in the public realm energy performance at each one of our assets. And what I think is going to happen is um, the state, the government, uh, and local governments are going to begin to use that data. And they're going to begin to um, uh, eventually require energy investments, either at the time of transaction or somewhere else along the line, if you, if you are uh, underperforming from an energy perspective. Uh, we met with, with Rebney uh, yesterday in New York, the real estate uh, board of, of New York, Rebney, and, and they are talking with the city of New York about this right now. And so I, I think that is going to revolutionize the way we prepare as owners of real estate because we're going to want to make sure that there's no encumbrances at the time of transaction and that we have fluidity in our, in our business. Yeah, I kind of think, um, kind of tagging on to what Ben said there, um, even like with the lead and, and having more, more cities, more states regulate and put as part of their code, these lead, re you know, lead regulations, I think the energy regulations will, will start to follow um, as part of, you know, even with lead or without lead, uh, become more of a, of a code and more of a necessity as we move forward. Just kind of looking ahead, so on the electric side um, of the industry, I think our perspective is we don't really know um, what the future is going to look like in 20 years, as one of my slides showed, but we need to be ready for it. So um, our grid needs to be ready to plug into these sustainable sources that are not necessarily in our backyard. We need to be ready to um, plug into you know sources up in Canada, off coast resources, and that's that's our challenge, and not just ours. You know, all all the utilities challenge. 
because um, things are changing fast and furious. Um, On-site generation, co-generation, um, we're seeing quite a bit of that now, the anaerobic digesters. So from our perspective, we just need to be nimble enough to make those decisions and be ready for that. Yeah. I should recognize that um, Eversource was extremely helpful with 888 Boylston Street, getting the interconnection approved for that project. The connection of distributed generation is still a very time intensive process. Um, the, the risk of adding a um, system that could backfeed at certain points in the network is a major problem. Uh, I think with better battery storage, that's going to change. It'll create more microgrids and smarter grids. Um, we're, seeing, we're running our first pilot right now. Um, hopefully, we're just approved by the state of New Jersey with, with Tesla and Solar City looking at um, installing some battery storage at, at a property we own called Carnegie Center. Uh, whether or not we get to a point of agreement, it's still un unclear, but we're, we're at the you know, finish line of that, and that's going to be um, a revolution for us as a company, having on-site renewable with battery storage, shaving peaks that way in a, in a really substantial manner. I have a question for, for Scion, if I can turn sure. on the moderator. Um, should we, we throw that at you? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe after the question. So, uh, so Sai, your, your analogy of, of the pike and adding lanes and, and needing to rethink and revolutionize how we, how we, uh, how we prepare for the future um, causes me to think about a very important tenant of ours. That we actually just built their headquarters, uh, NRG, in, in Princeton, New Jersey, at 804 Carnegie Center. David Crane, who was a great leader of that company, I think with a vision for a clean energy future, um, may have underestimated or mis miscalculated what the shareholders wanted for that company. And his early departure um, was, was certainly a shock to me as someone who I thought, um, who I was, I was a huge fan of his actually and his, his, his visionary outlook. I'm wondering, you as a leader of, of, a, of a great energy company, how you absorb that, that uh, occurrence and how you, how you digest that and how it helps you, um, how you reconsider or consider your revolution based on that kind of um, reception he received from their shareholders. Yeah, ph phenomenal question. Um, and for those of you not familiar with NRG, it's a phenomenal brand. Uh, it has a strong presence around the nation as a large power generation company and uh, also a consumer-facing company. And I agree with you, Ben. Uh, David's vision was a very strong vision and very similar to the items I mentioned today, not, not dissimilar at all. Uh, and David's predecessor, or successor, excuse me, Mauricio, holds that same tenant, as you put it, around uh, energy transition. How are we dealing with that? How are we dealing with what could be uh, perceived as maybe a failure on NRG's part or a failure on David's part. I do not believe that's the case. But look, energy companies like NG, like NRG, traditionally built their companies, as I mentioned at the beginning, around building infrastructure. And David's shareholders invested in an infrastructure company, 30 gigawatts of power generation in the US. We had a similar position, not as big, 13 gigawatts. For those of you that don't know, the first step we took in the revolution was to sell 10 of our 13 gigawatts. That was $7 billion. That's here in the US. It was not an easy decision for us. It was a decision that I belabored and still am grieving about. It was tough to do. But I believe to your question, Ben, that you cannot keep your foot in both sides of the equation. Either you want to be a proponent of the customer, not the tenant, 
not the ratepayer, the customer, or you want to be a proponent of building infrastructure. I don't think they can coexist in the long term. In the short term, there's still life to that. But in the long term, we need to be customer focused, federate to you, the customer, the ability to take the next step with the infrastructure we already have. So I think NRG's vision is phenomenal. The execution may or may not work, may have not worked. Will our execution work? A lot depends on our new family members. And it depends on how you as customers trust us. So please give a round of applause for our panelists. Patrick, Craig, Ben, phenomenal, great insights. Um, let me summarize my takeaways. I think as we discussed from the beginning, we feel that there's a natural revolution in energy. And that natural revolution is really just starting now. It's starting now where we actually think about energy from the consumption side of it, not the supply side. We heard from Ben and Craig that there is a call to action. That call to action, an altruistic call to action to help the environment. That call to action is an economic call to action. And we've seen the steps they are taking now to address that call to action. It's reduction in usage. It's optimization in usage. It's the first step at taking, as we say at NG, infrastructure and optimizing it. We heard from Patrick. We can't forget that we in the United States and in this region have a phenomenal advantage. And that advantage is a very robust well-engineered, well-managed grid, an infrastructure system. And as an NG company globally, that advantage does not exist, as you know, in many parts of the world. And we see what Eversource is doing to help make sure that we do not waste that asset, that we maintain it correctly, and how can we better use it? Both through building for future possible inevitabilities and by engaging, again, as we say, the consumer to help optimize. So I will tell you, however, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to leave you with one last analogy to help us as a group think about what could be five years, maybe 10, but I doubt any further than that. We're all familiar with the hyper-used terms of atomization of entrepreneurship, the sharing economy, the digital economy. hear that all the time. What I feel about that, and what NG feels about that, is let's look at any one of the high profile, high consumer driven brands right now, Uber. A lot of people feel Uber has really tackled the taxi cab industry. Maybe it's tackled the transportation industry, tackled Ford, Mercedes. But let's think about the problem a little bit differently and see how we can connect that to energy. What if you look at Uber's business model as a very simple thing? It's a network. And that network connected excess transportation capacity. The extra capacity where your car is unutilized 95% of the time 
the excess capacity that your car seats are used even less than that. And then on the other side of the equation, people that need to get from point A to point B. If you look at Uber's model as a network, it connected excess infrastructure with people that needed to use it without the need to invest any incremental money. We talked earlier about the grid. What if we could do the same? What if we could take the excess infrastructure and allow society to use it more effectively? When we look at the solar that's being put on the Ahold properties, that is effectively driving on the westbound direction of the mass turnpike during the morning rush hour. It's at the source that needs the energy. It offsets transmission. It offsets distribution. It offsets centralized generation. It's doing what Uber's doing. Think about Airbnb. No difference. Excess beds, excess shelter, connected to people that need it without the need to invest in incremental infrastructure. If we think about the energy revolution that way, you may start thinking of ways that go beyond what we talked about today. What we talked about today was how we improve efficiency. The next layer that we have to work on together is how do we federate customers? How do we not only improve the efficiency of our automobiles, but how do we get Ahold and Boston properties to carpool together? It's a very different equation, a very different way to think about our business, but it's putting control and the ability to affect the call to action in your hands, and we as NG want to be there to help you navigate that so that going back to our vision, we can create a better world for you through innovative energy solutions. So think about that. Dialogue with our brands, the Optera brand, the Green Charge Network, which needs to talk to you if you're gonna put a battery in. And I wanna call out a special brand that hosted this conference today. That's the NG Resources brand. Previously known as the GDF Suez Energy Resources brand, you'll be seeing that change on your bill soon, is what I'm told. Um, but all the NG brands are focused squarely on that initiative, helping you consume energy better. Thank you for your time today.